the last decades of the Qing Empire saw the concurrent rise of a strong reform movement and the first truly modern Chinese revolutionary party, the Guomindang of Dr. Sun Yat-sen. This week we'll look into the background of the important reformers and revolutionary movements within China that eventually toppled the Qing dynasty. To be fair, this video is centered more around Sun Yat-sen as the most important reform movements have already been covered in two previous videos. Sun Yat-sen's story, however, well, the man certainly lived an adventurous life, to say the least. After the 100 days of radical reform under the Guangxu Emperor in 1898, Empress Dowager Zixi launched her conservative coup d'etat. Those reformers that managed to flee established the society of protecting the emperor. Their goal was to realize a constitutional monarchy under Emperor Guangxu and the incremental creation of a parliament. China ought to modernize and it needed the full support of its nation. A constitutional monarchy was China's best bet to successfully modernize. Kang Yuwei, together with Yang Qichao, the principal architects of the 100 Days Reform, managed to flee to Japan. They received much support from young Chinese, many of whom studied in Tokyo and Kyoto. Due to educational reforms on the Chinese mainland, Kang Zaidea found support from the new Chinese intelligentsia, schooled under the new system. What exactly were the ideals by Kang that met so much resistance by the Qing and support among the young intelligentsia? Well, Kang reinterpreted many Confucian classics. He interpreted a passage in the Book of Rites as prescribing linear growth and evolution. Three stages he defined were disorder, approaching peace and small tranquility, and great peace and great unity. Based on this analysis, China was currently moving from a period of disorder towards approaching peace and small tranquility. Kung, in essence, managed to align all Chinese texts with Western theories of evolution and progress. This is very important as reform in China ought to be based on the classic texts and Confucian thought that so many civil servants and gentry were schooled upon. Part of the gentry, especially merchants and middle-class citizens living in urban areas, longed for modernization. Chinese emigrant communities and capitalists longed for a stronger state that was able to protect their interests. At any rate, Kang stayed for a time at Prince Okuma's, the founder of the Japanese Progressive Party. He had been Japan's prime minister, albeit briefly, in 1898 and was the author of the Okuma Doctrine. In essence, this doctrine propagated the notion that due to Japan modernizing before China, it owed the country a debt of aiding it with its process of modernization and guaranteeing its freedom. Inukai, a follower of Okuma, went to great lengths to have Chinese political exiles and revolutionaries meet each other. Inukai even managed to issue a meeting between Kang Yue and the founder of the revived China society, Dr. Yusun Yat-sen. Kang refused to meet Sun unless he pledged his allegiance, and the two men had fundamentally different notions of reformist thought. Sun considered a revolution necessary in order to establish a republic, while Kang vowed his loyalty to the Guangxu Emperor. Collaboration wasn't likely, but Sun Yat-sen, he would become very important in China's history for the decades to come. After 1905, the considerable moderate group of reformers would be surpassed in popularity by a much more radical organization led by Dr. Sun Yat-sen. So, what exactly were their objectives and who was Sun Yat-sen himself? Well, like Kang Yue, Sun Yat-sen too was originally from Canton, although from early on he had traveled all over the world. Canton, traditionally at the center of Western imperialism in China, Harbored groups of Chinese with strong anti-Western and anti-Qing feelings, as the Qing had been unable to protect the Chinese against the Westerners. Whereas Kang was educated based on Confucian classics, Sun Yat-sen received an entirely Westernized education. The Sino-French War, also known as the Tonkin War, and China's defeat of 1885 sparked his patriotism after experiencing the War of Clothes. Sun Yat-sen was ambivalent during his early life, however, asking himself whether he wanted to reform China or lead a revolution? It boiled down to one question. Did China have to be destroyed for it to be built up? Though not fruitful, Sun Yat-sen attempted to receive Liu Zhang's advice about and support for his reform ideas. Liu Zhang was the military leader of the anti-Taiping forces during the rebellion and notable proponent of the self-strengthening movement during the 1860s and 70s. He was convinced 
the usage of Western weaponry and military tactics would be necessary to safeguard the traditional Chinese values and rebuild Chinese strength and power in order to prevent further Western influence, use the barbarians to control the barbarians, as I said. Interestingly enough, they stood in stark contrast with Sun Yat-sen's conviction, who attempted to convince Li that the wealth, strength, and power of Western powers was not due to their gunboats and weaponry, but thanks to their education and the belief that people ought to develop fully to their capability. Free markets and usage of land, the developed codes of law, were among other things. Li did not even bother to grant Sun an audience, as Sun persistently argued in favor of these reasons. Bitter and disappointed, in 1894, in Honolulu, Hawaii, he founded the Revived China Society, a radical anti-Manchu secret organization. Its 112 members swore to expel the Manchu and install a federal republic. In 1895, together with 3,000 sympathizers, soon attempted to seize control of Canton. The whole rebellion was badly organized and had inadequate weaponry and funding. Qing authorities got wind of it, rounded as many revolutionaries up as they could, and 48 were to be executed. Soon fled the country, now officially living in exile as a revolutionary. From Hong Kong, Soon went to Japan and the United States, eventually traveling to Europe. Imperial agents attempted to kidnap Soon multiple times throughout these years. One of the more famous and admittedly clumsy attempts was a kidnap attempt in London, where Soon was locked up by Qing agents in the Chinese legation in London. The goal was to ship him back to China, have him sent trial, and have him executed. He was freed, however, and the botched abduction turned him into somewhat of a celebrity around Europe. Soon traveled all over Europe and the United States, refining his political thoughts and views. While in exile, the conservative coup against the emperor by Empress Dowager Zixi and the humiliating Boxer Protocol of 1901 only grew Soon's prestige, while that of the dynasty dwindled. Soon now seeking support from the same groups that Kang Yue was seeking support from. This shaped a bitter rivalry between the two men, whose political views, as we touched upon before, were far apart, though both condemned by Beijing. One such supporter was Charlie Soon. His three daughters would play a major role in Chinese politics during the next century. Ching Ling married Sun Yat-sen, only to join the communists under Mao Zedong after Soon's death, and Mei Ling married Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the Guomindang and the staunch opponent of Mao's communists. I promise you will hear more about them in a separate video. Sun Yat-sen's political program encompassed three main points which I will elaborate a bit upon. The first was the principle of nationalism. Sun Yat-sen wanted to liberate the Chinese from the foreign Manchu domination. Due to political and strategic reasons, Sun did not resist the foreigners and on multiple occasions explicitly confirmed he would comply with treaty agreements that Qing had signed. After all, Sun's revolution would have no chance of succeeding if he turned on the Western powers. The second principle was the people's power, and it encompassed the gradual implementation of Western-style democracy. The first stage after the revolution would be a military-style dictatorship. The second phase, an incremental democracy, and the last phase would be the implementation of a proper democracy. The institutions within the state would consist of five powers, the Montesquieu's Trias Politica, legislative, judiciary, and executive powers, supplemented with two traditionally Chinese institutions, a control, audit branch, and an examination branch, in order to select civil servants. Lastly, the third principle is as translated as people's welfare and livelihood. A government for the people, if you will. It was the socio-economic part of Sun's program. Emphasis was put on, among others, John Stewart's mill theory, that the value of land would increase due to industrialization. The increase in value should, via taxing the land, be distributed among the Chinese population. It would be the solution to social inequality. Interestingly enough, these three principles remain, as of today, the credo of China's Nationalist Party in Taiwan. In 1905, under Japanese encouragement, Sun Yat-sen was brought into contact with Wang Xing and others of the Yunnan group. I would go on to establish the Guomindang in 1911, but for now, in Tokyo in 1905, the Tung Mengui, the Revolutionary Alliance, was established. Sun was its chief executive, Wang Xing was the second in command, and other prominent revolutionaries were assigned to keep posts. The Tung Mengui had offices all over the world, from Brussels to Singapore. It had branches in 17 Chinese provinces. The Tung Mengui was becoming a force to be reckoned with. Republican and socialist ideas in line with Sun's ideology 
were distributed via the official Tung Mengui journal, The People, Min Pao. So Liang Qichao and Kang Yue's ideas for reform and a constitutional monarchy, following Japan's example, were vigorously attacked. It was argued that China would be able to surpass the West if only a few strong men took control of the country. Interestingly enough, Japan was used as an example for this point of view as well. Soon's three-stage program for democracy was backed by the magazine, though it seemed a bit simplistic. It was more appealing than the moderate views of a benevolent monarch. At any rate, after the Guangzhou emperor suspiciously passed away in 1908, one day before Empress Dowager Zixi died, and the three-year-old Pu Yi ascended to the throne, well, there was barely a case to be made in favor of that theory anyway. Throughout the years, there were several setbacks the revolutionaries suffered. Soon instigated, 10 rebellions between 1906 and 11, all of them failed. In 1907, Sun Yat-sen was expelled from Japan after a repeated request by the Qing to the Japanese government. Both Sun and Wang Xing settled in Hanoi, French Indochina, and orchestrated six rebellions in China while residing there. The French realized that these revolutionaries were inspiring the Vietnamese to stage their own uprisings and expelled them as well. In 1909, after four years of barely any results but many casualties, be it due to failed rebellions or government crackdowns, foreign financial aid in support of the revolution dwindled. Once again, soon embarked on a fundraising campaign to Eastern Europe and the United States. Some other members dissenting from the Tung Mengui resorted to anarchism. It was Wang Qingwei who tried to bomb the Prince Regent Chun. His assassination attempt failed and he was arrested and imprisoned. Nevertheless, anti-Qing sentiment among the Chinese population kept increasing. Wang Xing figured supporting troops of the Imperial Army had the best chance of succeeding. An army revolt in Canton in 1910, however, was suppressed. Another Canton rebellion a year later was doomed. When Wang's troops tried to seize government buildings, one of the battalions mistook another group of their soldiers for Imperial soldiers, and a firefight between the two groups of revolutionaries ensued. It did garner widespread sympathy and is memorialized with a large concrete obelisk that honored the 72 revolutionaries that lost their lives. Now, soon instigated 10 rebellions, right? Well, across China in 1909, there were 113 documented rebellions, most instigated by hungry peasants. The next year, there were 285. I think these numbers clearly portray the instability of the country. Most rebellions occurred around the region where the Taiping Rebellion waged 50 years before. Still, riots elsewhere broke out without a revolutionary ideology at the basis. The peasant peace riots in Hunan in 1910 and eventually the Provincial Railway Protection Movement that swept Sichuan in 1911 contributed to the erosion of Qing stability and control. It was a railway controversy that would directly contribute to the sequence of events that would lead to the demise of the Qing dynasty. I felt it was only right to provide a bit of background to the revolutionary movement that played a crucial part in this Qinghai revolution. Next week, I'll cover that revolution, oddly enough sparked by accident, and the abdication of Puyi, the last emperor, marking the demise of the Qing dynasty, which had now truly lost its mandate of heaven. If you want to know how the situation got up to this point in China, check out the playlist on the screen right now. It details the collapse of China's Qing dynasty from the Opium Wars all the way to the abdication of Puyi over half a century later. Thank you for watching this video, and if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, feel free to leave your thoughts in a comment. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.